This episode of the Elevate Your Leadership podcast is brought to you in part by iFly Virginia Beach Indoor Skydiving. At iFly Virginia Beach, we bring people together through the dream of flight. To learn more about our leadership development and team building, visit iFlyVirginiaBeach.com. Welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast series with U.S. Navy Special Operations veteran, CEO, and hockey fanatic, Bob Pizzini. Bob discusses leadership, success, failure, defining moments, and hard lessons learned with guests who are intentional in their approach to leadership. Leadership is a perishable skill. Use it or lose it. In this series, entrepreneurs, industry executives, academics, public figures, and other highly effective professionals share their formulas for success with you. All right. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Elevate Your Leadership. My name is Bob Pizzini. And if you lead in any capacity, you're going to love this podcast and my next guest. If you own a business and you are responsible for the welfare of others, you are going to love this episode of Elevate Your Leadership. My guest today is Joe Baldwin Trot. And before I introduce her formally, I just want to say that I like to interview guests who help me be a better leader, who help me bring greater value to my organization and especially those that I lead. And Joe is going to help us bring that value to you today. Joe Baldwin Trot mentors coaches on their spiritual business path. She holds space for empathetic coaches to expand their brand and their subconscious awareness. She is able to see, feel, and clear energy from our multidimensional selves, both past and present, and translate this to the workings of your business. Joe is an international best selling author and most recently has created Being Fine, the other F word. Ooh, we're going to talk about that. Stories from men who are inspiring other men to be vulnerable. She is a presenter and hosts two podcasts, The Women's Leading Show and The Dharma Show. She is the patron of Soul Sisters and Brothers UK and an ambassador for Women's Political Equity Group 5050 Parliament. She also sings in a band and channels Lilith. Ooh, I hope there's YouTube videos we can see. Joe spends her time on the south coast of the UK and Santa Barbara, California. Joe Baldwin Trot, welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Thanks, Bob. And thanks for getting me flying. Yeah. So, you know, I did warn you, I'm going to just talk nonstop about going skydiving. Honestly, it's one of the best things ever. <laughs> Super cool. I mean, that's uh, that's the life that I live and it is one of the best things. And I'm really glad to hear about that. We definitely want to hear more about that. Let's start with some really cool stuff you have going on R right out of your introduction. Empathetic coaches. So you hold space for empathetic coaches. Now, I know what empathy means, especially when you juxtapose it against apathy or sympathy, right? Pathy to feel, empathy to be with, etc. And I have an empathetic approach to leadership. But what exactly do you hold space or what does that mean that you hold space for empathetic coaches? So it's times are tough and they've been difficult. And there are many coaches who have really stepped into a place of empathy over the last two years. And I'm talking coaches from my friend Lottie Moore to Tony Robbins. It's been a beautiful thing to see that the coaches that are coaching the many have stepped into a role of being more self-responsible and also offering more, offering more in their services, in their messaging, but also more of themselves because there's nothing more empowering, inspiring than watching a leader who talks about their own struggles in a very, in just a concise way, um, but mentions and also creates that kind of connection on a human level that they have had their challenges, but they recognize what the challenge is going on for you. And they take that on board because motivational empathetic coaches like Tony Robbins, for example, they work on a much deeper level with their clients. I can tell, so I can I can read the spirit and soul. I'll stick to Tony, someone like him has really stepped into a beautiful space of really caring about the people that he really, I'm not saying he didn't care before, 
I just think this this time has given everyone a big test of, are you going to really jump on board this purpose of being here to serve? Or are you going to jump on the board, on the board of, of, well, actually, there's so much going on. I'm just going to have to close down and kind of come into myself. And I feel that's kind of a, quite a challenge. And that's a decision for a lot of people right now. And so empathetic coaches, really, and empathetic leaders, but coaches especially, they hold their space for hundreds, thousands, you know, multi-thousands of people. And they need someone to hold the space for them. And that's where I can step in because I'm a phenomenally, phenomenally old soul. I am actually Lily. So if we can have another conversation about that. But so I actually experienced so much and I have an ability on a very multidimensional level is the best way I can describe it. To hold the space for what someone is going through with complete discretion. I've been a police officer. You know, I know how to be discreet and hold space from people tell me literally everything that is going on for them. I can support them spiritually, emotionally, energetically through my Reiki and also through a business point of view because I've got business degrees and experience in the corporate world. So I feel they're the ones that are really being challenged right now because actually without, maybe without even realizing it, they are supporting so many and everyone on the level is going through some kind of little struggle or blip or difficulty. And so I feel they've been tested and I admire them greatly for holding the space for so many. I think, you know, leadership is a constant struggle. It, it doesn't mean it's, it's catastrophic or crisis mode, but it's a constant struggle, generally speaking. And a conscious leader is aware of that and a conscious leader prioritizes appropriately. You mentioned a few things there that I want to dig into. So you, when you talked about an empathetic approach, you talked about the leader recognizing their own shortcomings or their own failures or their struggles, I think is the word that you used. Certainly leadership is imperfect. And certainly there are occasions where we say, what was I thinking? Or how could I have made that, that incredibly wrong decision? So leaders go through that from time to time. It's part of the journey. It's part of being a leader. But the other part of that is we are willing to take a risk. We, we gather information, hopefully enough information to make an informed decision. And then at some point, we're willing to take that risk. And I think our faith has to outweigh our fear in that risk analysis to enable us to proceed. Okay, you mentioned coaching and listening and people are sharing everything. Where's the boundary between being a coach, a business coach, a leadership coach versus a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a psychoanalysis? Well, sometimes there isn't one because... Uh, I I feel it's always about being really open and honest with who you are and what you can offer. And then it's for someone to make a choice. But if you've been in business or you're someone who has studied people, which I have since the day I was born, you will automatically have gained a psychology of life and of people in a degree or some kind of format. Uh, I have had conversations with someone who has literally gone down the psychological academic route I said, you know more than me and you, you don't have a degree in this. So it, it's about what you, where you're coming from. And I, I feel as long as you're honest with people and say, well, this is where I'm coming from. This is where my heart and my soul, off, that's what I'm offering from my place. And it's, it's then their choice. Um, and I, I think as long as you're sharing that your absolute truth of a message, then people will feel your knowledge. They'll feel your expertise and the letters after the name won't matter. I feel we're stepping away from that, I'm going to call it a three-dimensional view of education. Yes, I've got name, letters after my name. Do I use them? No. You know, yes, I've spent years in university education. Do I need them? No, but they've helped me get to where I, I am. So I've got that. But actually now I look back, and think, well, actually I can spend three years traveling India. I probably would have got much more of a, an experience of people and humanity in life than spending three years in a classroom in Buckinghamshire in the rain. But, you know, I, I, I think people, it feels to me, people are really are starting to sort of be more discerning of how the kind of the expression comes out and whether it comes from a truthful place. Um, I was recently had a, a kind of a little incident on, um, on, one, on my Facebook, Facebook posts about the current situation. And this person who has all these different these certificates accused me of being uneducated and ignorant and that person happened to be a man it was fascinating I was really appreciative of actually that that kind of comment these kind of things get you to look at who you are and what you believe in and what you and it just made me dig deeper go 
I've got the net. I, I didn't even, I started replying with all my, all my qualifications and I just deleted it. I said, why am I playing this game? Who does this matter to? It matters to me and it matters to the people I look after. If they believe I'm qualified to do what I'm offering, then that's all that matters. I really don't care what he thinks. You know, successful people have what Jeffrey Hazlett calls haters. You have people who don't believe in who you are or what you do. They question your motives and they're haters. But you, I think you articulated that very well. It makes you go back. They, those haters, make you go back and look at who you are and what you're about and what you're doing and stay connected to your truth. I experience that from time to time as well. You know, I've got some haters out there. And again, Jeffrey Hazlett is brilliant when he says that um, that's a necessary component of success. If applied the right way, we keep ourselves on the true course. Yeah. And I would, so I'm really mindful of my language. Uh, you know, conscious language is, uh, I, I feel very important, especially in these times. And so I would prefer to call them people who, who are in fear, because there's no real such thing as hate. There's always just an element of being fearful of something. I feel this person was fearful of what I was offering because it wasn't what he believed. So I was challenging his views and beliefs. And actually, that can be one of the biggest gifts that we're given. And I know Jeff, you know, Jeffrey definitely has had a fair few people criticizing him. But if you're going to stick your head above you know, others and give a slightly different message to what people are used to hearing, it's part and parcel that you're going to test people. And it's part and parcel that you would also get people thinking, well, what does that mean to me? And some people will re react very strongly. And I've, I've had a, a tirade of you know, negativity from certain, all men actually, and, and that's not a coincidence, but I don't necessarily think it's relevant that it, they're men. It's just that I'm a woman giving a, a, a feminine, straight masculine message that has challenged them. So yeah, I, I just see them as a gift. Trollers, yeah, thank you. That's really <laughs> trollers. helpful. Okay, trollers, okay, trollers. Thank you, thank you for that. It's really helpful for you to raise that to me because now I just believe in myself even more. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's great. So you, we, you talked about men versus women a little bit in your profession, in the spiritual aspect, in the educational aspect, regarding all things leadership, generally speaking, do you, do you see great differences? Is there diversity? What's your take on men versus women in this space? So in the space of kind of mentoring and coaching, it's, it's been really interesting. I think there are a lot of male leaders that have really gone down the kind of the platform selling route and very successfully and very much embrace the NLP element if I've got this question right for you Bob um, but I think that's kind of been fascinating for me so what what I'm seeing now is women embracing and actually supporting the growth of men to be more intuitive to be more discerning more human more connected less prognosis less NLP we know those games yeah, I did a blog recently about this. We know the NLP games. We know how they work. They served us for a purpose and time. But it, are we coming out of that? I feel like we are. And I feel there's, it's a beautiful time, actually, in business generally, because the feminine energy, we've all got masculine and feminine energy, the feminine energy of intuition, of compassion, is coming through more and more. Quite frankly, it's like if a leader and a business isn't going to dip into that element of themselves now they probably possibly are because if you can't find some empathy and compassion right now with the challenges that people are facing but that's quite unlikely to happen so i feel it's a beautiful time i feel that the masculine and feminine male female leaders are coming to a space of more mutually respect and also of also role modeling a lot of women that are stepping in more into their feminine energy you know i've had hundreds of clients female leading clients that have been dressed like a man, sounded like a man, changed their voice, gone in with such an aggressive behavior that they've adopted in, in fear of showing up too feminine. I feel that's falling away and that's crumbling away. And I'm really excited about that. Okay, and that so then, that then, sorry, that, that then just creates more space for a man to be a man in his masculine energy to support and to be more true and consistent in his energy for the woman that, is, that he's working with. I'm really excited. I think it's one of the best times for leadership ever. You know, ultimately, we want to be ourselves, whether you're a man and, and the masculinity that you bring 
to the workplace or a woman and uh, the aspects of being a woman, the feminism the, that you bring to the workplace. These are, these are positive traits within us. And the best within us is what we want to bring, masculine, feminine, etc. The woman who dressed like a man, changed her voice, etc. And I've heard, I've heard these types of things before. How did that work for her? How does that work for women who follow that guidance, generally speaking? Going back to your very first, first part of what you just said, we actually want to be ourselves. So when we're not, we're feeling we're struggling. When we're not, we're feeling conflict. When we're not, we're leaving ourselves at home. You know, this was one of always my first questions. Like, which parts of you do you take to work? Oh, I take my kind of really determined, strong, confident part. What about the soft and sensitive part? It manifests as stress. It manifests as illness. It manifests as, as actually bullying. Because the irony is, you know, the, the sad thing is that we... If we and I, I was guilty of this when I was in the police force. I would show up pretending and trying to be, you know, like my six foot six counterparts, <laughs> and you know, with with more determination, aggression, and never needing support, never needing help. But actually, it brought more aggression and negativity to me because I was that's you attract what you are and what you put out. So actually, it kind of can really fall foul, and and, and it can cause incredible problems and um, to the nth degree of it being illness when I left the police force I was stressed I was really unwell and re- almost verging on very seriously depressed because I'd, huh. I'd quashed myself down I'd made myself small and I'd hidden away the feminine part of me to show up as fully me and also fully me as my personality because the other thing uh, that we do sadly I feel if we're going down that road is that we hide a part of our personality because how can I show up as a woman if I'm trying to be a man? And what does that person you create a new persona to be that person? It's rarely ever going to be fully you either. So that's a double whammy of falseness and, and not showing up. Was that early in your career uh, when you were a police officer? Was that in your younger days? So cop. Not that you're not young we're, now. We're, we're still young, Bob. Come on, we're still absolutely, young. Absolutely, no absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love throwing me in the young world. I was about 23, 24 when I joined the police. I okay. went to university. I traveled first. I spent a year in Australia in the outback. So I did loads of things before I went into the police. Consciously, I wanted to get experience and get my business degree first. And then I went into the police. So I was a bit older. But I think the, I think probably the answer to your question was that I was very young. I was very that, that was the premise of the question. Unce- is, I was uncertain of who I was. Yeah, and, exactly. In all of our in everybody younger and as they're just starting their professional lives, everybody has they have two things. They have a degree of uncertainty that's probably subconscious that they don't talk about, but then they have what they present, which is this confidence. And in your case, you're going to keep up with that 6'6 police commander, which you know is not real or perhaps limited. So, so we have to go through that journey of self-discovery to arrive at, at the youthful place that you and I are at right now. Definitely, definitely. Well, and ultimately, it always comes down to you attract what you are. And I had nothing but bullying, harassment, abuse. And that was just in the police station. That's before I stepped outside the door. (laughs) That wasn't on the streets. Yeah. So, but I attracted it, you know, ridiculous amounts of violence. Ridiculous. It'll all go in the book. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) one day. Maybe. That's a book I don't know if I'm going to write or not. But, but, you know, that's the sad truth is that you then bring it in because you're showing up, you're presenting yourself as being a victim of whatever it is. And then therefore it all came to me. In, huh. in its strobes, it was one thing after another, after nine years. Okay, okay. Nine years. Well, you talked about this gentleman who challenged you earlier, and you went back and looked at your Facebook profile, etc., and all these letters after our names, and university and education. I will say, in my experience, that there are three pillars to being an effective leader. There's experience, there is formal education, and then there are these trainings, these macro or micro training events, if you will, which over you know hundreds of events over the course of many, many years, this discussion you and I are having could be considered one of those trainings, you know, one of those macro or micro trainings. But I think those three things, education, experience, and training are critical to effective leadership. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or you're young or you're old. Obviously, the older we are, the more of that experience we have. Do you find, looking at your background, do you find that those three things are critical to, I'm sorry, to who Joe Baldwin Trot is today? 
I do, but I would go, you know, from a, a spiritual kind of evolving journey that I come from, I just see it all as experience. And I see it all as training and I still see it all as education. So okay. spending a year in the, in the Outbook of Australia was educational. It just wasn't on paper and it wasn't in the format of a presentation. And it was but a it hell of an experience. experience. <laughs> but it was an education too, because it was an education in people. It was an sure. I, I was an 18 year old pasty pal pom going out and, and put up fencing for eight miles in the outback. That takes leadership. Okay, we are at our first break for capitalism. We will be back in just a minute. And we are back with Joel Baldwin Trot. We're talking about all things leadership, spirituality, consciousness. Before the break, Joe was telling us about her experience in the Outback. She spent a year doing very rigorous activity that the average 18, I think you said you were 18 years old at the time. This is something the average 18 year old does not experience. But Joe, tell us about that and what you learned from that. So talking about leadership and what it takes, and I, I just I just feel that, that the experience of working in different environments can give you an education, it can give you training, but it not, isn't necessarily in, on the paper format. I think, uh, you know, when I was in Australia, I kind of threw myself into everything. I just said, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. And so I ended up working in the, literally in the middle of the very the bleakest parts of the outback, if you like, uh, putting up eight miles of fencing, working with a group of guys and I had to really develop my leadership skills then as an 18 year old that was just straight out of school and obviously surrounded by beefy Australians <laughs> um, so there were definitely a plus sides to this but it was great because I learned skills that I would never have learned if I'd started my degree at 18 and that experience has kept me and, and held me in good stead as a police officer you know l- looking after teams there managing and the people skills so I feel like it's one big pot, Bob, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, see, yeah. I see it as one big pot of experience. You know, when I'm looking after some clients, they'll, they'll talk over something, they'll explain something, and they'll say, oh, but, but, you know, I didn't, that was just a job doing X. But when they're talking about an experience that happened within a certain job, I'm like, hey, let's look at what the learning was within that. Let's look at what you actually took away from that. There's more weight sometimes in these moments than going spend three years at university, that there is more learning, there's more, more acknowledgement, more self-development. And I think I feel that's, that's, we can easily look over and look past a lot of things that have happened to us. But actually, if you just kind of recollect, I think, well, actually, where, where was there a shift? And that for me was a shift. Firstly, being in the middle of nowhere in Australia, bloody hot, but also just having to deal with these guys who weren't used to a, an English girl coming along with the voice I have got but it was brilliant because I had to dig deep and I had to say look I had to think about how am I going to get these guys on board I had to get them on board otherwise they would have just completely ignored me and or just taken them out of me (laughs) yeah dig deep and, and what did I learn and how did I change and how did I grow I call those defining moments and in elevate your leadership I share a defining moment that happened uh in my military career it really got me to look at myself and say listen, going forward, you've got to be true to yourself. You've got to be true to those you work for, and you have to be true to those who work for you 100% of the time. Not 90, not 99, not 75. It's 100% of the time. You have to have that true intent. So that was a defining moment for me. And it sounds like you've had, that was a defining moment at that time in your life. And I'm sure you've had several since. An important aspect of self-discovery and growth is, is capturing these defining moments and saying, what just happened and, and how can I change? And sometimes it takes years to evaluate those things and really resolve or, or decide how much stronger you are from that. Joe, you're just hitting on so many different things that I find so important. You talk about awareness and subconscious awareness. Now, I talk about conscious leadership. I talk about taking the tools of leadership and having them in your conscious mind. So when different situations present themselves, you consciously address the situation rather than let your sympathetic nervous system take you out of the driver's seat. You know, you consciously, you make sure your parasympathetic is engaged and you consciously address the situation. What do you mean by subconscious awareness? So I'm, I'm talking about the awareness that goes deeper. And actually, I'd, I'd almost say it's a fully connected, even heart-centered connection awareness because our subconsciouses are our rulers unfortunately 
that's the, the bad news <laughs> is that our subconscious is they they literally have the reins and so you're right the, the consciousness is the expression and that's where it's that's where it's kind of formulated and out it comes but prior to that the subconscious is where it all goes on that's the workings that's the minions and the subconscious is where all the work can and i feel can be done to create the conscious leadership that that is the best that you could ever offer this planet and this lifetime. And it's what's, it's what's stored in our subconsciousness and the programming, it's been said a gazillion times, but it's the programmings that we have from this life and I believe previous lives that is stuck like a loop in there. And they're the ones, we can become super aware of that. So it's the, it's the base on the same principle, Bob, is like taking a moment taking a moment before you react don't respond react but take a moment before you react and respond um, and that is i feel is the key to great leadership is that you give yourself time to fully connect with what you're feeling what you're thinking but also where the messaging is coming from where is that messaging coming from i have a little game that i've played in my life and i really recommend it to anyone so when I have a voice coming up to react to something, I tune into the voice and it takes a bit of practice, but I guess all this stuff does to some extent if you're not used to it. But I take a moment to tune into where the voice is coming from and what does it sound like? And it does take a bit of just like a moment to pause. I think actually whose voice is that? And more often than not, I've realized and that took to me to being a young 40 something so I realized that most of my messages aren't my voice. They're someone else's voice. They're my mother's, they're my father's, they're my sister's, they're my school teacher's. And if you give yourself that permission to take yourself back, whose voice actually is saying this value or this belief? And suddenly you realize that so much of what comes out of our mouths is actually not really based on our beliefs. And what I've done is just got used to this game, get used to playing this game and testing myself. And so now I only speak my truth of what is my voice, what is my belief. And I've ditched a load of beliefs and values and I've just got rid of them, but they don't serve me. They weren't mine anyway. Someone gave them to me and I took them readily. I don't want them anymore. And that then allows us to be very conscious in our language and conscious of, of what we're delivering or what we're choosing to do. Or I feel it's a fully connected uh, leadership is, is one of the, is, is, the, is the happy place as well. Because when we're connecting what, with what we feel, we're embracing and valuing that as well. Then we're saying, hey, here I am, I'm human. This is how I feel. Let's not talk about what we think anymore. Let's talk about what we feel. How do you feel about that decision? So that's a whole nother discussion, think versus feel. Joe Dispenza, amongst the many books that are out there, Joe Dispenza, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, Thoughts Versus Feeling, and Elevate Your Leadership. Once again, in, the, in, my, in my coaching, and in the uh, leadership experience that I deliver, I talk about thoughts versus feeling. Earlier in the discussion, you said, I feel, and I keyed in on that. I didn't ask you about it, but I keyed in on that because I thought to myself, is that really a feeling or is that a thought? And there's a distinct difference between the two, in my opinion. You know, thoughts are very linear and feelings are of the body more so than of the mind. They're feelings. It could be the, the senses, but it's also intuition. It's these things that give you a, a sense, if you will. Do you distinguish between thoughts and feelings? Yeah, totally. But that's, that's what I'm saying about this game I play. Because what I've realized is so many of my thoughts aren't my true feelings. So what I'm saying is that, you know, by, by checking in, so I only try and express my feelings that then, it, that then are translated through my thoughts, that then are translated into language. You know, and you mentioned that that's not my voice. That's my parents' voice. That's my teacher's voice. That's a voice of somebody else. That is so true. And that is so common. And that is one of those things that, again, if you are very conscious and deliberate in your approach, you do kind of shed that and develop your own voice. And that's, I just think you express that brilliantly. Joe, we should do like a series two and a series three and a series four. There's so much to discuss. I want to I'd ask you. <laughs> good, good. I want to ask you a few questions. Why Santa Barbara? You said you spend your time on the coast in the UK and then Santa Barbara in the US. Bob, have you been to Santa Barbara? Uh, you know, I've been all over California, but I haven't been to Santa Barbara. Well, that only someone who hasn't been to Santa Barbara would cite, would ask me why Santa Barbara. Because it's the best place on the planet, Bob. It's just that simple. Okay. It's just, it's just 
absolutely beautiful. It's got a beautiful energy. Obviously, energy matters to me. Put it this way, I went there for the first time like 19 years ago with my partner at the time. And he said, I've got to take you to my favorite place in America. And we've done a lot of America together. Um, we drove into Santa Barbara. Thought, oh my God, this feels good. Really like it here. The people are so friendly. The, just the, the Santa Inez Mountains as a backdrop. We we're just like, wow. By the time I left, I cried. I was wow. like, I have to live here. I have to live here. This is where I'm destined to be. I felt this connection. And one of my previous lives was definitely in the Sioux tribe. So I've spent a lot of time traveling around that part of California in my previous life. It's home for me. I feel more at home in Santa Barbara than I do in the UK. It's where I'm meant to be, Bob. Okay, well, that's... <laughs> you got to go there. I, I, I think <laughs> you, you have... That. You won't want to leave. <laughs> I think you have more than thoroughly answered that question. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and then let's talk a little bit about your singing. What genre do you sing? And, uh, you know, what's your, what's your musical preference? So soulful pop is, is the songs I write and sing. So, yeah, okay. they're kind of soulful pop. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a little crazy, but it's my diva, my inner diva. Okay. And I just I just love singing. I love writing songs. I'm always writing songs, writing poems. Okay. And, um, yeah. And so Xavier, Xavier Rudd is my latest God, favorite singer, songwriter. Have you heard of Xavier Rudd? Uh, I don't believe I have, but I'm a, I'm a classic rock and roll, although I do like classical music. You know, I like all the genres, but I haven't heard of that artist. Uh, what is that? I'll send you a song. So he writes, he writes soulful pop, but it's beautiful. I mean, some of it's quite rocky, some of it's quite attitude-y. Uh, Paul Simon, um, Simon and Garfunkel are a big influence, but so is Bruce Springsteen. Okay. Yeah, I think you might like him, Bob. Give that him, sounds give interesting. Him yeah. There's a song called Follow the Sun by him, which I was funny enough listening to just before I came on today. Ah. It will, I, I promise you it has just the most joyful feeling to it. But no, I, I love, I love all genres. I have, yeah, actually even dated quite a big rock star. That was fun. That was really good fun. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's rock and roll is part of my life too, but I love opera. There's nothing like an actual opera. I play an instrument. I'm a, a hack drummer, if you will. So I like to play the drums from time to time, but uh, nothing cool. I'm stuck with. Do you play well, I'm, a, I'm a hack guitarist then, so... Okay. You know, I All can right. play well, guitar. I can, if someone puts some chords in front of me, I can, I can play the chords. I know, I know how to play, but I'm, I, maybe I we should stick to singing. Maybe we should pick a song and make one of those YouTube videos like the artists are doing where they're, in, you know, because of COVID, they're all at, at home, but they're playing their part. Up, so. up for, up for, yeah. I, Zoom needs like, like fun time. Let's do it, Bob. We can do it. We'll, okay. We'll get someone, um, get someone else playing. What else what do we need? We need a bass, really. Yeah. Get a, a bass, for, bass from Australia. A bass player from Australia. There we go. And then we're okay. kind of covering the whole globe. We're just going to jam. Yeah, so the international, right? An international jam that'll be super cool with spirituality and and well, components. Savio is of... free. Savio is an Australian. Perhaps he's free. He can join us. Okay, check with him, would you please? I will. <laughs> and then let's talk about. Of course, we saved the best for last. The most important part of this discussion. You flew at iFly in Basingstoke. My friend Simon Ward owns those operations in the UK. And you expressed great joy. Let's hear about your experience. I should, I've got my magnet. I should have brought it ready to show uh. you on camera. <laughs> Goodness me. I, I mean, I love flying. I've been a bird in a previous life many times. I absolutely love any form of flying. And I've always wanted to try skydiving, but I love being in a plane, jumping out of the plane. It just gives me complete chills. I just get, I'm getting hot just thinking about it. <laughs> so when you offered up I fly, I thought, right, this has got to be, this is just a gift. I've been wanting to do more flying again. I want to start some flying lessons. And I went along with my daughter, put it this way. I was the one that was screeching and squealing, sounding like a kid when she was the one going, yeah, that was quite cool, mum. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. How old is it, your daughter? 14. So uh, she's, te she's a teenager. So, you know, perfect. Kind of, but they often have a mute button, don't they? But yeah. Yeah, it was just amazing. I God, seriously, it was just one of the best experiences to actually know what it feels like a to be a bird, right? It's like you know, and I'm I love birds. And I was actually, how how would it be like to fly? Just to feel, and also just the rush of it, because the guy he they were so great. There was a guy called Enrique who Enrique, Enrico, sorry, who looked after us. And at the end, he said, "Oh, does anyone want to go for one quick last time? Like do a really." quick spin and go to like the max velocity because uh -huh. they change the velocity they start you off gentle so you can just get a feel for it i'm doing it my hands things so you've got to do this with your hands and you've got to dip your hands I, yeah i'm glad you saved this to last because i could go on about it for hours and he said do you want to go up I said, yeah 
so we did this and I spun around oh my god I just was like nothing better than that feeling of like spinning of like you know have you yeah. seen point have you seen point break Bob oh absolutely me too gazillions of times yeah so I've always watched that film thinking oh my gosh that looks such a rush to do skydiving well maybe before you go and do try and be Patrick Swayze or Keanu Reeves whichever one you fancy um maybe try I fly first because it's just a brilliant way to do it without having to jump out of the plane I will jump out of the plane one day but I've booked I've booked the special the four four re repeat visits because I've got to go back and do it again that's great that's great that's a great crew over there too Trev Haynes and Tracy and just wonderful people and that's part of the experience you know interacting with those wonderful people is part of it I'm so glad you did it and had fun and I'm glad your daughter did it and had fun this is it's one of those things that families can do together. And you're right, this feeling of freedom and you're literally flying your body. It's not a roller coaster. You don't strap in and hang on. You are literally flying and you love birds. And I hear the birds in the background uh, from your garden. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. They really looked after us. Um, they were so, so kind. And there was a, a little girl that tried it as well. And, you know, just tiny little dots. So it's, it is really all ages. There was a whole family there. There was eight of them. Yeah, all er various ages that did it as well. Yeah, and I've had lots of friends since who saw my videos that right, I've got to take my kids. I said, yeah, yeah, you'll want to go back for sure. It's it's that, brilliant, really good that's, fun. That's great. That's super great, Joe. Um, how can people get a hold of you if they want to know more about you and your offerings to the world? Yeah, so LinkedIn's my favorite place to be. I just love LinkedIn. I like the energy of LinkedIn. It's very um, professional, but it's also sensitive, and it's got the. I think it's a great social media platform. So Joe Baldwin-Trot on LinkedIn. Um, and also my website of my name, Joe Baldwin Trot, is good. And if you'd like one of my books, so you mentioned Being Fine earlier, is my Being Fine latest book for men. It's a, a very powerful book, sharing of many stories from men about their mental health journeys. So I'm really passionate about this book. It's also supporting a mental health charity in the UK. So, uh, you know what? We have to have another. I need to read that book and we need to have another discussion about that because having served in the military for 26 years and gone through all the trials and tribulations that are very commonplace today. I pay a lot of attention to that for my own personal health and wellness, but also how can I help others in that capacity? So, so please send me a copy of that. And, I will. Um, signed, of course. And... Oh, okay. <laughs> when I'm famous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I'd love to read that book and then have another discussion about that. Yeah, that would be so, great. Joe Baldwin Trot, any parting words? Oh, just to tune into yourself, folks. Life is quite tough at the moment. The challenge is being fired at us. But put yourself in your space, hold your center in the, from the solar plexus point, and just trust yourself and just come from that place of trust and honesty that's within you. There's a lot of noise out there. Just turn the volume down on the noise and just listen to the voices within you. That's all I'd like to finish with. That sounds fantastic. Turn the volume down on the noise. Turn the volume down on your phone, Bob. And while we're doing that, my phone's ringing here. I thought I turned everything off. There we off. go. That's me. It's my witchy powers. Watch out. <laughs> turn the volume down on the noise. We're going to end it with that. Joe Baldwin Trot, thank you so much. Great discussion. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. To contact Bob directly or to learn more about how Bob can advance you and your organization through leadership training, team building, executive coaching, and public speaking, visit robertpizzini.com, robert, P-I-Z-Z-I-N-I.com, and connect with him on LinkedIn.